let's just tell, tell me about how you got involved in UFOs and when that happened. Well, I was 23 at the time and had been doing a bit of research on UFOs because I'd heard about a man, a famous man called George Adamski who um, had amazing um, direct meetings with aliens and that triggered off my interest. I wrote to George Adamski and thanked him for his book which I was very impressed with and he wrote back to me telling me <clears throat> thank you for your interest because um, in those days people hardly mentioned the, the, the UFOs um, and then um, my next um, important encounter was reading a magazine called The Outspan in South Africa famous magazine and this lady by the name of Elizabeth Clara K-L-A-R-E-R, -E a German name, um, was um, um, talking about f uh, first on contact, head on contact with an alien and gave birth to a child. So I thought, this is too amazing. I have to meet this lady. And I heard, what pro oh, sorry, I did actually phone her. Uh, managed to get a phone number through the magazine article and I told her of my interest and that I knew about George Adamski who she also knew about and she told me that she would visit Natal where um, I lived but she was in the Transvaal at the time in Johannesburg and she offered to meet me in Pietermaritzburg which is the capital of Natal and I was so excited, I already was impressed with the way she spoke and sounding a very educated woman. So um, I eventually um, managed to persuade a very reluctant brother-in-law to get out his wonky old car and travel for miles over farm roads to a place called Rosetta um, where her family lived, her sister and got the uh, reluctant brother to um, find his way there, which was quite a mission. <laughs> and of course, I say reluctant because I'd been talking a lot about UFOs before I met Elizabeth to the family, and they weren't interested and laughed it off. And Roy, that was his name, he said, look, I'm going to take you to meet this nutcase, as he called her, um, and when you find out how crazy she is, you will keep quiet about UFOs. So I said, you're on. I will do anything to meet her. I said, because uh, she could only be um, either telling the truth or, um, I should say it the other way around, she could be a hoaxer um, or hallucinated or telling the truth. One of those things she's got to be. And if she's telling the truth, I want to meet her. So now we, we get there to the farmhouse and we're sitting there and she walks into the room, a very dignified, beautifully dressed, cultured, attractive woman. But she didn't say a word. We just sat there wondering what was going on because she's just smiling at us and looking from one to the other. And then all of a sudden spoke and of course in the interim Roy suddenly goes like this and says, you see what I mean by crazy? I knew what that meant, you know. So well, when she spoke, she said to me, you, my dear, have come here out of a sincere interest and you've done quite a bit of research, haven't you? And I sort of, you know, got smacked, nodded. And then, you young man, you don't know anything about this. Um, you're just here out of curiosity. So he goes very red in the face because that was so true. And then I realized why she'd been quiet for so long, because she was kind of reading us. And this is what she's correctly picking up. But right away, I thought, this woman is something else. I got very interested in her. And I thought, she's some kind of psychic as well, because how could she do this? So then, um, 
And on another occasion, I think it was, I don't think it was that first time. No, I beg your pardon. It was the first time because Roy saw her daughter. Uh, it was, I'm trying to think, but not her daughter. Uh, yes, it was Marilyn. Sorry, I'm going back over many, many years. <clears throat> there was a young, beautiful girl there, and Roy had his eye on her because she was sort of meandering around us. And um, she said, would you like to go to the top of the hill, which is named Flying Saucer Hill, after her famous experience of meeting an alien? And um, we said, yes, we'd love to. So I kicked off my shoes and we went over the felt, as they call it in South Africa, the rough grass. And um, Roy dutifully following the young, attractive lady and um, hoping we, we might see something. But um, we didn't on that occasion. But I was already so impressed and when she actually po pointed to a, an area of the grass after many years, I can't, don't ask me to remember the years at this stage, um, where the grass was still cut in a circular pattern. It had never really grown back the same length as the rest of the grass. So I stared at that and I thought, yes, that could have been a spaceship landing. But um, I was almost hoping um, that something would happen because we were there, but nothing did. But I saw her looking up at the sky and I looked up and I saw these white egrets that they have over there in South Africa. And in the sunshine, they glint silver. And I was looking at her and she saw this and she said, yes, my dear, I also used to think there might have been uh, a spaceship. So, uh, we, you know, she said, we have to uh, eliminate th things like that. <laughs> And uh, of course, um, it was shortly after that again that I, I kept in contact with her. And I had already, uh, just trying to remember, it was 1992, I think, when I started the, my own UFO club, which I hadn't started before um, I'd met her. I was in the process of doing something about it after my research with and finding George Adamski. Um, and I hope to um, um, further, you know, my, my research in this way. Mm -hmm. I did um, already want to start a UFO club in Peter Marisburg. And when now I've got Elizabeth, um, I did mention that to her and hoped that um, she would come down for an initial meeting, which she did. And the local press were there. And I have an article in my scrapbook, I have a scrapbook on all the activities involving Elizabeth over a period of 10 years. So it's rather hard to just tap into what comes next, you know, especially when being elderly myself, you know, the me old memory is not so good. But um, it really uh, was amazing when she did come down and there were over 300 people came to hear her because I'd advertised it in the press what this lady claimed to be, that she claimed to have had a child to an alien who she named Archon and that it was all written in her book Beyond the Light Barrier. So. I was really um, hoping to get all this across to a, a new UFO club. So when I opened the doors there, there were, it was standing room only, as I may have just mentioned, there's over 300 people pitched up, which was published in the local Natal Witness, is the name of the uh, Peter Maritzburg leading newspaper, who were very interested in her story. and. Um, Taking it from there, she often had to go back to Johannesburg where she lived and she would visit Natal. And she always visited Natal around about the 6th, 7th or 8th of April. Those specific dates because Archon would come to meet her in Natal. And I had proof of that which um, I'm hoping will be mentioned in the film which is being 
made at the moment. And the interesting thing was that, I think to tell you this way, a young nurse by the name of Vanessa Thompson phoned me one day and she said, you know this Elizabeth Clara? So I said, yes, who told you that? She said, well, her friends of yours from the u university. And um, I would very much like to meet you because I've heard rumors about this lady. Did she really meet an alien and have a child? I said, yes, she did. She, I feel I can give you proof, but rather wait till you uh, come and visit me. You do come and visit me. So um, she did. But then an amazing thing happened just after that. Um, there was a man driving from Johannesburg, who was her father, Blythe Thompson, from, also from Johannesburg. And he was giving a lift to two army boys who just finished camp for a two-year stint. And the one kid suddenly points to a figure on the freeway. And he says, what's that man doing there in a spacesuit? So um, Blythe said, I don't know, but that man's got the most handsome spiritual face I've ever seen in my life. I think he's from another world, so I'm going to go back. And he tries to turn the car around, and this kid goes into a dead panic, because now he's on the outskirts of, of the lights of Peter Marisburg showing. Uh, they've been in camp, they, he just wants to go home. He says, no, you think he's, we might be abducted or something if he's an alien? You think he's an alien? He's panicking away. And he says, okay, okay, keep calm. I understand your fears. I think you've made me miss a valuable experience, not knowing he was just shortly to get the valuable experience. Mm -hmm. And he walked into the flat where his daughter uh, lived, couldn't wait to tell her about this man in a spacesuit on the freeway. She can't wait. The timing of this is incredible. She can't wait to tell him she's met me and has the book in her hands, which she's rushed to the city to buy. And on page 33 was the drawing of Archon, which um, Elizabeth, being an artist, had done a very good likeness, apparently, because he wouldn't be photographed, because he, if he wants to walk around in our planet and visit her regularly, as he did for many years, um, he could be uh, arrested if they ever found him, if they ever tied him up with her. They could, you know, tricked her into um, exposing him. So um, that was um, very, very interesting because he's walking into the flat. She can't wait to show him the book with the photograph on page uh, 33. And he can't wait to tell her about the guy on the freeway in the spacesuit. So when he heard about me and all that, he, he told her, I've got to meet this guy. Kitty Smith and find out what this is all about because I have seen that man on the freeway and he was about six foot four so um, which was correct and apparently he used to um, visit Elizabeth often each year either on 6th, 7th or 8th of April for some reason maybe due to the distance from his planet he didn't always want to keep the vigil date when they first met on the 7th. And um, he, um, this man was very impressed to hear direct from me that I knew Elizabeth, who had written the book intimately. And he said, I can't wait to meet you. I've got to go to Germany. And when I come back, I wish to meet you and Elizabeth Clara because I live in Johannesburg, which he did. But um, what was so amazing was the date that he's phoning me to tell me he has seen this man in a spaceship, 6th of April. And I said to him on the phone, you most likely have met this man and seen him because he comes on the 6th, 7th or 8th of April. He varies each year, not always on the exact 7th. And I'm pretty sure that you have seen him because you've given me th this date. So that was a very interesting episode. And I heard 
from friends that this man was often seen driving around Rosetta, is where the, the spaceship landed and where the hill is called, Flying Saucer Hill to this day. And Blair Thompson's car was often seen driving around looking for him, hoping to see him again, because he was so impressed with the meeting. So uh, that was a very interesting episode of my life because he, he did uh, phone Elizabeth because they both lived in Johannesburg, so he was able to meet her. And when I did phone Elizabeth and tell her this, this guy says he's seen Archon on the freeway, she said, oh really? She said, that's interesting, you know, she's because he has been here. <laughs> and she said, I don't want to know why he Archon showed himself sit, standing there on the freeway. Good question. So she said, invite the young lady up to where I'm staying in Peter Marisburg with a friend. And I did. And she questioned the young nurse. And she did say to her, did your father... Oh, first of all, she said to me over the phone, he wouldn't have seen Archon physically. He would only have seen a, a three-dimensional image, which is a hologram. And Elizabeth said, but don't tell the young nurse that. When, bring her up and I will question her. So I did. And uh, she was um, sitting there and she suddenly fires the question at Vanessa and um, says, did your father notice anything at all unusual about the figure? So I can hear her to this day. And she said, Oh yes, she said, Daddy said he seemed kind of lit up. So Elizabeth looks at me and I, I look at her and we explain to Vanessa why we're looking like this. And she said, dear, your father didn't see him physically. He saw him as a hologram, which is very real. And she said, it's a three-dimensional image. Have you heard of a, of a hologram? Of course she hadn't. But um, she said, but I want to know why did Archon show himself um, to him? Um, and she said, what does your father do? So this was interesting. <laughs> he turns out to be a member of parliament for a place called Kloof in Natal there. And he's fighting, urging the government, I should say, to keep fighting against pollution of the planet. So that, to me, gave a valid reason for the whole thing happening. Uh, you can't be, help but be amazed at how Archon tied it all up together. That I meet the nurse and this father's travelling down all the way on the freeway from Johannesburg and they get to meet me to validate everything. Yeah. And. Um, it's, it's always been, there's always been something very interesting happening to me through knowing Elizabeth over 10 years. In fact, one of my more impressive things I like to mention is when she was asked to um, give a speech at a conference of scientists, about 20 or 25 of them, except, I forget the exact number, in Wiesbaden in Germany. And um, she told me quite an interesting little <laughs> side story to that. Um, she was booked in at a hotel in Wiesbaden, which is shaped like a UFO, I believe. And the manager came to her and said, um, you know, we have booked a very nice suite here for you, Elizabeth. And she said, oh, well, why so big? I don't need such a large suite. I'd like a small one, like Anna, the Russian delegate. So they said, oh no, we have a special reason for giving you a large suite. She opens the door and there's Archon. He'd come down to prep her, sort of, to speak to 25 world scientists would be quite a mission. And he knew how intensively she'd be questioned because she has got advanced knowledge of physics and interplanetary travel and so much information to give them and he wanted to give her the confidence and the knowledge to do it and to go over a few points. So she said, Kitty, what was amazing to me, she told me it was so funny. He'd walk up and down to emphasize various points and she said, these people, I've never seen an alien, remember? 
they never took their eyes off him. She said, it, it was like being at Wimbledon there. She said, when he walked to the left, all the heads went that way. When he walked to the right, well, all the way around, <laughs> um, the heads were good we go that way. She said, they never took their eyes off him. And I said, well, I don't blame him, <laughs> quite frankly. And he's a very impressive, handsome man, and uh, six foot four, you know, and um, very um, knowledgeable and wise. And I never saw him personally, but he did give me a sighting of his ship, which is another story. Um, I went to the mountains of the Drakensberg, um, to the place where she used to meet him. Now there's a hotel at the foot of a mountain there, it's called Champagne Castle Hotel. It's rather a lovely hotel. And she'd go up on horseback for two hours, fighting baboons and snakes, to meet him, where he used to land on a plateau uh, to the side of this huge mountain. Yeah, so we, I went there with a friend and my son Gregory, who was only 13 at the time, and we're sitting there quietly, enjoying a lovely um, sort of pleasant summer evening over a swimming pool. And my friend Joy, who is a rather naive little person, didn't know much about UFOs, but jabs me in the ribs and saying, we haven't seen anything, have we? You were hoping to see a UFO? Ark on ship, maybe, because this is the place where she used to meet. He used to meet um, Elizabeth. So I said, "That's right. Well, it's been lovely being here. It's been so nice." And she said, "Oh, but what's that?" Almost in the same sentence. And I looked, and I just saw this cloud with a light inside it, slowly coming along the sky and stopped dead over the, the swimming pool. I said, I've got to, I haven't got my glasses and I've got to report this to my UFO club. So I ran back to the Rondavel, the, the little huts that they have there, and um, got my glasses. When I came back, my son's jumping up and down and he says, look, Mum, it's come out of the cloud. I said, oh, yeah. And there's this huge silver, blue silvery, huge ball of light, about three times the size of the moon, maybe even bigger. I'm not good at measuring f from that distance. <laughs> And um, there was another couple, both pointing at it like that. So I said, let's go and join them. Let's sit, let's go. And this man says to me, <laughs> it was a big mistake, this. Um, he says, oh my God, have you ever seen anything like that in your life before? I said, no, no. He says, what do you think of this? So I said, well, I think maybe it's a spaceship. You know, I was so excited inside, hoping, hoping, you know, it was him. And. Um, he said, um, oh, don't be silly, you can't possibly believe in things like that. He said, if you believe things like that, he said, you must be a daughter of the devil. So I thought, uh oh, we've got a, a very religious man here. He's fanatical about the Bible. And he starts quoting a chapter and verse to me till Joy, got my friend, got so weary of him. And she said, let's go, he's attacking you, he's so hostile. I said, I'm used to that. I said, his mind is closed. And I'm not going because I want to see his face when the spaceship moves. <laughs> so I let him talk. I said, no, I believe in God more than you would ever know. You know, so forget this devil talk, I said to him. But he carried on and on, you know. So the next minute he thinks he's one, you see. So he points out, he says, so you see, lady, it can't possibly ex they can't possibly exist. And he said that, it just went horizontally and dropped like stone behind the mountain. So this poor man just says, uh, puts his hands to his face and says, oh my God, the Northern Star, which he thought it was, the Northern Star doesn't do that. And I said, no, the Northern Star doesn't travel and stop and start again in the sky either. <laughs> and I walked away thinking that's a, a relief to get away from the, the Bible um, threat, you know. <laughs> um, and my friend Joy was quite overcome with, with the whole thing, and my son too, but um, t today he doesn't always like to talk about it because, you know, he's in business and people still are inclined to scoff at UFOs even in this year of 2019. 
but I think there's a lot more belief around with the mushrooming of um, UFO clubs and this club in Brisbane I am delighted to be a member because I've learned a great deal more from you people and only too happy to be able to give you any information on Elizabeth's life story hoping I can remember as much as possible for your records <laughs> so I don't know if you have anything else you, you would like to ask about it. Elizabeth one time was having a usual meeting with Archon and she was in his ship and he suddenly looked at the radar and said you'll have to go back home to the farm because it was her sister's farm actually, it wasn't her real home. She visited there often to meet him and <clears throat> he said the Russians are on to me. So he, she gathered up some sandwiches and tea quickly and he said you must get back on that horse and get back immediately. She got down too late. Mm -hmm. There was this Russian professor who came and blocked her and said, Mrs. Um, Clara, we have captured you, just be calm. <clears throat> and she said, well, I'll try, but I'm in shock. And if you want me to keep this child, because they said, I don't know how they knew, but they said, we know about the child and we want, we'll find him very useful to have in our laboratories over in Russia, because he'll be a scientist. Uh, we knew it was going to be a boy, I don't know, but he, we were thinking he might be a scientist with the knowledge that Archon had, and they wanted that. And she said, all right, you've captured me, but I am in shock, and would you excuse me if I would have partake of some of these tea and sandwiches, and your crew, they had other, other men with him, um, may partake of it as well. He said, by all means, he was only so thrilled that he's got it. But what he didn't know was, she playing for time because she's telepathic with all living creatures including animals especially her horses she was an expert horse um, um, what do you call it you know she does show jumping and all that sort of thing and Peter Marisburg and um, she just um, you know called the horse to her telepathically and the horse came and nuzzled her and she mounted in a flash because she's an expert horse and but he fired a shot at her not to um, kill her but it hit a laser shot at, and just you know demolished a rock on the side he just wanted her to be dismounted you see fall off but not to kill her so okay she managed to get away and uh, galloped away and ended up um, in a cave where she stayed because it was a terrible thunderstorm. They have very bad thunderstorms in the tower and um, <clears throat> she got away from the Russians but spent the night in the cave and she said all birds and animals all coming in the cave with her to avoid the storm and her son David was looking for her the next morning. She spent the night there it was a horrible experience for her and he was out looking for her um, because the Zulu groom who was with her, he, she said his eyes were just rolling at his Russian who had captured her. He rode back to the farm and told David what had happened. So he was out looking for her in the morning and eventually got her home safely. But that was a, a very dangerous experience for her to have. She could have lost that child, but fortunately didn't. Oh, another uh, further point to mention there was the postmaster, at, it's a Jeppy Street uh, post office in Johannesburg, and he um, kept getting in touch with Elizabeth because he kept getting telegrams from Russia. This professor professed stupidly, obviously not true, uh, that he'd fallen for her, that she was very beautiful and that she could marry him. He would, would hope that he could offer a proposal of marriage and get her to Russia, anything to get her there. 
and of course she didn't believe all that, but uh, the, the postmaster, <laughs> the Jeppy Street Post Office, they got fed up with all these urgent um, telegrams and everything that was coming over, you know, and he said, could you please tell this man to stop sending them to you and I've got to deliver them to you? And that, um, I'm sure she'd be glad to have escaped from that. Mm. And she's been a very brave lady. And brave also in another way of fa facing um, crit critics, um, com rude, very rude comments often. And I wrote to the uh, editor of this newspaper and I said, I have to complain about shoddy journalism in your newspaper. I said, because this has no conception, no idea of the person she was dealing with in her diatribe, is that the word, an attack on Elizabeth Clara, who is a, a very respected by lots of people all around the world, and I put a long story backing up Elizabeth. And the editor took my letter, showed it, who burst into tears at reading it, we calling her journalism shoddy, and that she's no conception of the integrity and spiritual qualities of Elizabeth it would be beyond her perception sort of thing. I was pretty rough, you know. <laughs> and um, the editor took my letter to show it to Elizabeth, because the, the press knew her as well, very well. And she was so grateful to me for it, at attacking this journalist. And um, she says silly things like, oh, you know, Liz Babe ain't, ain't no lettuce head. I felt like saying, I put that in my letter to them. I'll say she's no lettuce head. She's got a Cambridge degree in meteorology and um, has various other credentials, which would be beyond this woman's perception, you see. So Elizabeth was very grateful always for my support. And Ocon was grateful for my support. So. There came a time when I had a sighting of what I hoped to be Archon ship, because I, I mentioned just now where this other couple were there, you know, the, the Bible student, <laughs> and um, it really um, was amazing that that happened because it. it advertised the presence of Archon because uh, I would go to the press on everything, you know, I'd report to the press what I was doing at various mm -hmm. times too and they followed me, they accepted me. With that um, sighting, of course, naturally um, I reported it to Elizabeth and I said that this man was there, you know, um, dismissing it all and she, I said, I don't think it could be Ockham, I mean, it could be any old spaceship. And she says, no, dear. I went on the phone, she said, it was him. And um, he did come. And he was coming to prove his existence to you. So uh, I said, but I'm finding it hard to believe that he come 4.2 light years away from the planet Metan just because Greg and I and my friend Joy <laughs> were going to the, to the place where she used to meet him, you know. And she said, why do you find that so hard to believe that it was his ship? I said, well, I'm not the government or the Air Force or anybody important, I'm just little old me, you know. And she said, he told me it was arranged for you because you have supported me for so many years and supported my people on on the planet to give the message to the earth of how they should be changing their ways to live a more positive and harmonious life. And he's very grateful for you being so unafraid and to go public. She told me all that. It's come back. And um, I was, I was really still quite awestruck that it was an arranged sighting.
And of course, <laughs> now I'm in Australia, and, and um, when was it? Two, I've been here six years now. And it was either 2012 or 13 when, uh, no, I've been here two years when another sighting occurred. And this is quite amusing because I'm sleeping in my son and daughter-in-law's home and we have a cat called Mali. Mali had an awful habit of meowing in the middle of the night and waking you up. But this particular night she was very bad and <laughs> screaming outside the door. So I opened the door and I said, Oh, I suppose you want to go down to, to the uh, cave. We have a garage, as we call it the man cave, where my son sits there. And the cat's food is all there. So I said, OK, I'll take you down. You are a nuisance. And walking down, and there's a glass door I'm passing on my left. And I saw this look that's drawn to this red-orange orb in the sky, which you might remember I've reported to your UFO club, our UFO club, sorry. <laughs> I'm very grateful to be a member too. And um, this was so amazing that um, I looked at it and I thought, oh, I better get my glasses, I've got to report it to the club. So I dashed back into my room. When I came back, I looked at it and I said, looked at it and I said, oh, you've moved, because it, it was there in this pain. <laughs> of the, the big uh, glass doors there. And now it's come right in front of me, if you come back. So as I said that, it dutifully went back to the original position and shot straight up in the air and disappeared. And afterwards I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, if the cat hadn't meowed and that, I would have missed that experience. <laughs> and I thought maybe I like to think, it could be Archon saying, Oh, we know where you are now. You're in Australia and you're a member of the UFO club who believe in me, you know. <laughs> well, most of you do, I hope. <laughs> and, uh, he, um, he must be an in incredible uh, person, really, all these years that he kept visiting her, because he was risking his life as well. If they could have got hold of him, they would have just put him under the microscope and jab needles and God knows what else into him, see what made him tick. And I'm very relieved that then I hope to God that he's still okay, because I don't know if he's still visiting the planet, because Elizabeth died over 20 years ago, and there were a lot of people at the funeral where I went to it and the press covered it. And there are lots of incidents, you know, that I'm probably not remembering all of them at the moment, but I did know her over 10 years. And she was always very grateful for my support because I did organize the one public address that she gave with the 300 people who hammered her with questions. And the, pre the press to this day, uh, when I left, um, it was it 2012, um, South Africa, They've asked me to keep in touch if the film that's been made about the story, um, where they interviewed me for over, I think it was over an hour, they questioned me as a, a personal friend of Elizabeth. But the film was, they interviewed a lot of other people too, and a, a, a whole profile on Elizabeth's life. So I'm really really disappointed they've taken so long to get the film off the ground. I've even sent them financial support to help because they need funds. I don't know what, what, the, what the funds used for making films. I don't know much about the film industry. But um, they told me in November, last November, they're hoping this year to um, get it off the ground and maybe we'll get, have a copy and be able to see everything that's in that film. So um, there'll probably be much more than what I've mentioned because this Ugo Carlini, is, um, she runs Tower Cop Creations, which people can Google. It's um, U-G-A, her first name and Carlini is C-A-R-L-I-N-I. -I. It's an Italian name, but she's Afrikaans. And she 
always has been a big supporter of Elizabeth's story and did a lot of research and everything in making the film and I think has interviewed people in Johannesburg as well as me in, in Peter Maritzburg. It was very nice that they uh, took me up to the mountains where um, he used to um, arrive and um, they took me for lunch to this lovely hotel and interviewed me, as I say, for over an hour. I remember thinking um, that maybe uh, she's going to tail off just now because I was getting pretty exhausted answering all the questions. So that I know I'll give her a cut-off line, see if she grabs it. So in the middle of it all, I suddenly say, yes, I really think Elizabeth Clara's story should be told to the world which it has been um, various parts. I mean, I know she went overseas too. She went to America and spoke to the Americans. And I think it was brought up in the House of Lords. There's a man called Honorable Brinsley Lepore Trench, I always remember his name, who was some big shot over there, who um, mentioned her story to the uh, British uh, government. So, um, her fame, I think, has already spread far and wide, but I think the main message from it all is what Archon's been striving for, is to prove to people that we cannot go on living the way we are with the barbaric wars that we have. We haven't progressed at all hardly from the Stone Age. We've just found more diabolical means of, of killing people as opposed to when we hit a man with a club on the head from the Stone Age. And mankind hasn't learned. It, he's just carrying on, warring more than ever. And I think we did have a gentleman at the UFO club that recently predicts there might be some sort of mass introduction of the angels to us all in 2021. So that's not so far away. Or maybe uh, if we get a grand visitation, it, it um, might wake people up to realize they are here for us. That whether there are, Elizabeth did mention, there's some aliens that are not kindly disposed. And I even heard a rumor only the other day that the, um, the Pleiadians have been battling with um, the reptilians, which I don't know much about that but uh, there are, there's a war going on up there at the moment. So we have to look into these things, and I know you cannot accept everything on face value, but I feel I've done enough research and many years of knowing a very, very wonderful lady who was beautiful in every aspect. She was totally honest and musical. She told me to stick to my music, playing the piano. We both love Mozart. And she said, music is healing. She taught me many little things like that, and I wish I would remember them all. But um, she taught me how to live positively and bravely. She said to me, Archon said, you're very brave to face the public, because it, I, you know, he knew, I should say, that Elizabeth had to do the same. And to be ridiculed quite strongly is very daunting. But I also like her. I think of her and I carry on. Even my son says, Mom, do you have to tell everybody about UFOs and people visit the house? And I said, yes, I do. I mean, the whole purpose of me knowing all about this is to tell everybody. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? I refused to keep quiet. <laughs> How she felt about le leaving him, yes. Having to leave him. All it was time, yeah. ve very heartbreaking for her. Yeah. Okay. I mean, first of all, she uh, when she had to give birth to the child, he had to be born there. He couldn't have been born on Earth. He wouldn't have survived. And the birth, she said, was completely uh, harmonious and pain painless because he delivered his own child under hy hypnosis induction sort of so she, she said it was all very beautiful and harmonious and great joy to her 
but of course she did uh, have to leave him there. He, um, in two years of our Earth time, he would be 18 on the planet. And one day she was able to meet him. She phoned me. Uh, she went to a cottage, cottage, beach cottage in the Manzum Toti in the Tal on the coast. And she said she was sitting there one day and all of a sudden the French doors blew open and in walked Archon and Ailing, that was his name, A-Y-L-I-N-G. Archon was six foot four and Ailing was six foot seven and they were dressed in frog suits. And she was so amazed, she just said, oh, this is wonderful. Because, you know, she hadn't seen him grow and to grow so rapidly in two of our Earth years was amazing to her. I think the answer came to me there that maybe because they're so evolved, they don't need to go through the painful, terrible ups and downs of childhood that, that we have. Because they're so evolved, they don't need to go through all that. I don't know, but um, that that's what happened. And um, where was I? Maybe you can fool me. They, in. <laughs> they, they walked in the door. Oh, yes. And um, she said, oh, my goodness, and why are you dressed like this in frog suits? And they smiled and said, oh, it was easy. The spaceship can go under water, my dear. It is, we went to the, the seabed there, and it, it just released the two of them, and they swam ashore, and nobody looked twice at them. So, um, but it, they were doing that to hide the ship, not to, anything to do with their appearance, because nobody would look twice at guys in, in frog suits. So it, it, the ship would stay under there for when to pick him up later. So she had a very exciting visit from them. And um, I'm sure that she does, she would have at that time, really missed her son. Do because she was quite overcome with the visit and to see him looking so nice and six foot seven of him. <laughs> yes. Do you think that she died a lonely woman? Um, she never felt apart from him. Because often when I visited her, she'd be in telepathic communion with him all the time. And one time I was looking at her and I just felt he was with her. Her face looked different. And I just said to her, sorry Elizabeth, am I right? But is I'll come with you right this moment? She said, yes dear, could you see that? I said, yeah, I, I can't see him, but I can see something over your face that, like, there's another image coming over her face, and I just felt it was him. And I realised just how close she is to him then. Obviously, he didn't need a telephone. <laughs> but she was very advanced and things like that. I, I suppose you could call it she would be full-blown psychic and into a telepathy and all those things. And she always told me to cling to music, which I may have mentioned, but she said music is healing. Mm. Well, it's not uncommon for people to have, who have close encounters. People who have close encounters often become, uh, their, their intuition and psychic abilities are often heightened. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. 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 There was a woman called Alma Geyser, who was a close friend of Elizabeth, and she'd come down to Natal and stay with her. And one night he came down in the mist, and she said it was easy for him to come down in the mist, and he came to this house. And I remember Alma and Geyser speaking to me in Afrikaans, and she was saying, Kitty, you won't believe it, Archon was here in my house. <laughs> and she said, and Elizabeth didn't wake me. She was fed up because she would like to have seen him. And Elizabeth said, no, sorry, dear. With your heart condition, he and he had very little time to spend with me, still helping her write the book beyond the light barrier. Yeah. I always remember her so excited yeah. the next morning, saying, yeah. Ockham was here in my house, which she said in Afrikaans. Yeah. You know, Ockham was here in my house, which is very <laughs> similar. You know? And um, she was so disappointed they didn't wake her up. But Elizabeth said to me, she said, yes, it was easy for him to come down in a residential area 
um, because of the mist. I don't know why the mist made it easy, but apparently that's what she said. And I know you'd like to know that she, everything that she has said to me. And you never came down the mist to see me, but I was very pleased <laughs> to um, see her ship in the mountains there. Interesting. And mm. just, just um, about the story with the gravity belt. Oh, the gravity belt, yes, that was very amusing. Um, he he often um, pick her up and take her off in the spaceship and go back to this lonely farm. You see, it's not like a residential area. The ship could discreetly drop him off and her and push off again. Um, but this one time was a terrible storm and it was night time. And her sister, uh, May Fowler was her name, uh, who owned the farm, very frail lady. Um, she was anxious because Elizabeth was gone in the storm, you see, and she thought she should be home now. So she ran to the front door to see, looking at the weather, and to her amazement, she sees <laughs> Archon carrying Elizabeth, floating, very rapidly, and gets her into, safely into the farmhouse. And she said, how did that happen? <laughs> So he said, it was easy, my dear. He said, it was much faster so she wouldn't get quite so wet because I took this off, his gravity belt, because he, he wears that when he wants to walk on Earth. And of course that night, he very gentlemanly floated her back into the farm. <laughs> when you knew Elizabeth, what, what the UFO community was like in Africa? Um, I actually was surprised that 300 people came because here I've advertised beforehand is a woman who claims to have had a child to an alien and she, he would visit the earth here in the town and that drew them. It was, I was opening the doors to, the, we hired a, a huge room at a school actually, at a school and um, I remember having to shut the door and say I don't let any more people in because it's the standing room only there, and they're all squashed, you know. It's most uncomfortable. And um, she did speak to them and tell them about Archon's people and what the whole mission is all about. And again, emphasized his concern with the way we live on this planet. And of course, one part I didn't mention before she gave birth to the child, she, the last four months of her pregnancy, she was on the planet. And she mentions so many lovely things of how comfortable she felt in the clothes that they wore, because she'd wear them as well, flowing sort of beautiful robes. And the food was much better than ours, a complete vegetarian. They do not kill animals in any shape or form. Also, when she was on the planet, um, awaiting the, the arrival of the, her son, um, the horses there were wild horses, but they weren't wild like ours. They would just come up to her and nuzzle her, and she had complete rapport with them. And he said, yes, our animals even are not aggressive. And she learned a lot, I think, being up there in that four months. Probably could have told me a lot more, but had to come back um, after the birth and had to have an electronic device put on her heart because she spent the last four months up there and it had affected her heart. So it's really a beautiful, true love story, but very sad too, because she had to live on Earth. She couldn't have survived if she stayed any longer up there. But it didn't worry her when I asked her about that. And she said, no dear, our souls are connected. We shall always be together. So I like to think that when she died, that um, that she had joined him again. And incidentally, he was 2,000 years old. There was some professor of some 
professor, I think he was in America, wrote to Elizabeth. And he, he I don't know how he worked it out, but he said he must be about 2,000 years old. I don't know how he could work that out. I'm not into the, those kind of figures, you know, <laughs> or physics. I mean, she knew physics and was highly educated. She had a chemist degree in meteorology, which I may have mentioned. And she could handle any questions on physics or anything like that. You must and, have worked. Uh, I mean, she told me an amusing story about Eric van Dynikam, because he was at one of these the scientists' conferences, and she and the Russian delegate were a bit concerned for him, because she said he's a very excitable man, and he was getting rather carried away with his talking, and they were watching his toupee on his head, because it kept sliding more and more forward, and he was trying to eat soup, and Anna and her were making bets as to how soon that toupee was going to land in the soup, which it eventually did. <laughs> and I, I loved it when she told me um, odd little incidents like that, you know. wish I could remember more, but it's a long time ago. <coughs> and I hope one day maybe I'll meet Archon personally, and maybe he'll be in spirit with us today. I hope and will be watching you both and being approving of you recording this for the club because it's now going down on record and it's adding to Elizabeth's book Beyond the Light Barrier, which we have mentioned. It's an incredible book and I recommend everybody to read it. On behalf of you for Research Queensland, I'd like to thank Kitty Smith for giving her time today, for sharing her experiences with us about her times that she spent with Elizabeth Clara. Thanks, Kitty.